recently adopted a new rescue dog. Ez is going to share a picture so that you can all see him. His name is Frank. He was actually officially known in the foster system as Little Frank to distinguish him from the much larger dog aptly named Big Frank. And Little Frank is indeed petite. He is a Yorkie, a Terrier mix, and, and come on, one of the cutest things I've ever seen. He is wiggly and cuddly and loves everyone that he meets. He greets each person that walks through our door with an enthusiasm that borders on dangerous. When he met my brother-in-law, Josh, for the first time, Frank took a flying leap off the back of our couch, face planted onto the floor, and then leapt back up with a tongue out smile. Noah and I were horrified thinking, did we just break our dog in the first few days that we have him? He was fine. Now Frank and I have settled into a morning routine. He pops up on the side of my bed as soon as the alarm goes off and demands belly rubs. And then he wrestles with this little stuffed elephant as I get ready. And then we make our way outside for the morning walk. And we had this especially lovely walk on Thursday morning. Frank got to sniff at least four other dogs. Strong start to the day. Then we stopped by my gym and one of the trainers came out to greet his boy, Frank, with lots of treats. And then as we were getting stalled there, because Frank had to say hello to each person coming or going from their workout, uh, I saw the bus stop down the street where there was a little boy waiting for the bus with his caregiver. And as soon as this little boy saw Frank, he began waving excitedly and yelling, hello, puppy. <laughs> now, I'll be honest, I was feeling a little antsy. The walk was taking kind of a while and I was ready to get back home and get a move on with the day. But I mean, if someone's waving, hello, puppy, from across the street, you sort of have to stop and pause. So after I checked in with his caregiver, I, I said, hey, you, you can pet him if you want. He's really friendly. And the little boy crouched down and took Frank's entire head in his hands and smushed their faces together. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that all of us just stopped to look at how cute this was. Everyone, me, the boy's caregiver, another person at the bus stop, a woman waiting to cross the street, even someone who was getting into their car, we all just stopped at this moment of just pure, precious joy. So the little boy and Frank began to play together and you know, the rest of us started to smile at one another and make some conversation. And I felt my whole body that had been so anxious to start the day just kind of relax. Things could wait. I later realized that Frank was teaching me a lesson on that walk. Frank was teaching me a lesson on prayer. 
I started to think, what if I approached my prayer life the way that my dog approaches his morning walk? What if I made it a habit to pray for others the way that Frank greets each person that he sees without discrimination? So this might sound initially kind of silly, but I really do believe that all of God's creation is available for learning. All of God's creatures, including very good boys like Frank, can teach us something, point us toward the divine. Jesus does this. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus points to the birds of the air as a lesson on fear and anxiety. So why not look for, to dogs for a lesson on prayer? Prayer is supposed to be this central part of our faith life, right? Prayer is essential to Jesus and the disciples, the prophets, and Christians throughout the ages. Yet, how many of us, if we're honest, have a regular prayer life? And how many of us actually, as 1 Timothy says, pray for everyone? My dog Frank is pretty good at this. The rest of us might need a little encouragement. Paul writes here to a disciple named Timothy. Paul is a mentor to Timothy, and he has sent Timothy to the church in Ephesus. The Ephesians, they're in conflict and disagreement, arguing about their differences in their background and theology. And so Timothy is told to go and sort it out. He's supposed to go and correct the church. And so this letter that Paul writes is sort of an instruction manual with practical advice on how to accomplish this task. Paul writes throughout the letter with some straightforward guidance on how to be the church. And today's section focuses on prayer and the universality of God's grace. Prayer and grace, according to Paul, who, remember, is telling the truth. He is not lying. They're central to church life and something the Ephesians should practice. But why? Why should they pray? Why do we pray? Yes, Paul tells us that we should, and Jesus tells, me that, tells us that we should, and God tells us that we should, but why? Well, prayer builds our relationship with God. Have you ever heard that phrase, communication is key? We know this is true in our human relationships, our relationships with friends, family, co-workers, romantic partners, spouses. Healthy communication is foundational to a healthy relationship. The same is true for our relationship with God. God wants to hear from us, and God wants to share with us in return. And prayer is also one of the ways that we participate in God's work. Again, Paul's pretty straightforward here in 1 Timothy. He writes in verses 5 and 6, There is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself as ransom for all. This is something called the kergama, the proclamation of faith, the central thing of faith. Paul is saying God is the divine creator who gives grace for all people and who sent Jesus to bring an estranged humanity, a cut-off humanity, back into relationship with God. God's grace is for everyone. And our prayer life allows us to participate in that. 
Our prayer life allows us to experience this wholeness, this interconnectedness with one another and with creation. So yes, we really should be praying for everyone. The person who cuts you off in traffic, your best friend, the coworker who was on your last nerve, your siblings, the unhoused person you passed on the way to the grocery store, the grocery store clerk who scanned your groceries, the person you envy and you keep looking at their social media and you're really jealous of the trip they just took, your landlord, the addicted, the incarcerated, your spouse, your classmate, and all those people that you just simply don't like. Now, if your first reaction is, I really don't want to. Congratulations, you're a human being. We're good at praying for the people that we love. And we're good at praying for the people we like. We're okay at praying for the people we don't know. And we can even, on our good days, we can pray for the people who annoy us. But the people we hate? The people who have hurt us, the people who are doing bad things in the world, why should we pray for them? Prayer brings us in touch. Praying for everyone brings us in touch with the profound truth that God's grace is for everyone. Not just the people you would give it to, not just the people I would give it to. And that's this really radical thing about Jesus. Don't ever let anyone tell you Jesus didn't say or do anything radical. This is radical. Praying for and giving grace to everyone. Not just the people we like, not just the people who are good, but like really everyone. Praying for everyone, it, it puts us intimately in touch with the fact that God's grace is universal. It goes from this thing that's theoretical, yeah, yeah, God, God loves everyone, we know that, to something that we actually know and live and breathe and say. This is why we should pray. But what about the how? How do we pray for everyone? Because it's not easy. Well, prayer takes many forms. Paul names a few supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Some of these forms might come more naturally to us than others. Again, we're pretty good at saying thank you to God for the good things in our lives. Or as a little theologian put it this morning, for the things we like the most. Yet this list also gives us some insight into how we might pray those more difficult prayers, the uncomfortable prayers, the hard prayers. Here's one example. Paul says that we should pray for kings and all who are in high positions. We should pray for our leaders, our elected officials, whoever they are, whether we agree with them, or not. Anyone have trouble with that one? We should pray for the ones we believe are doing good and the ones we believe are not. Paul is giving us a challenge here and also a piece of wisdom. Notice that he says pray for, not pray to. Pray for those in power. Do not pray to them. Paul's saying, don't get it twisted. Those people aren't your salvation. But we should pray for them so that we might all lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Pray for them so that all people can have true peace, so that all people can have true dignity. We can disagree, we can dislike, we can even be working against a certain political figure and still pray for them. Pray that they might be led to create a society of peace and dignity for all. 
These are called prayers of supplication, prayers that ask something of God. Paul also names prayers of intercession. These can take many different forms, but a profound example, two profound examples, are other scriptures we heard this morning. Psalm 23 is a prayer of supplication. So too is Jeremiah 8, 18 through 9, 1. Now that scripture from Jeremiah might not sound much like a prayer. It's pretty depressing. It's a hard scripture to read. It's filled with suffering and pain. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? This too is a prayer. This is a pouring out of hurt that asks God to get involved. I am grieving, God. I am in pain, God. I am ill, God. I am dismayed, God. We're told to pray for everyone. This will necessarily mean prayers for people and for situations that have hurt us body, mind, and soul. And those prayers might sometime look like this one from Jeremiah. I am hurt. My joy is gone. My heart is sick. This person has caused me pain, and I don't know what to do, but I will pray. Is there a bomb for me? Is there a bomb for them? And in this way, we invite God into the pain with us. And who knows what happens once God gets involved? Who knows? Who knows what truth might come? Who knows what reconciliation might come? Who knows what justice might come? Is there a bomb? We heard a reassurance, didn't we? That Lois saying, there is the bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. God promises to meet us in our prayers. God promises to soothe us in our prayers. And here's the last part. God promises to change us through our prayers. If our prayers strengthen our relationship with God, if prayer allows us to participate in the work of God's grace, then prayer will certainly change us. Frank's insistence on greeting each person on our walk changed my day. It changed my day. I talked with people I wouldn't have otherwise. I said hello to my neighbors. I stopped being anxious. I was forced to slow down and witness joy when all I wanted to rush and get to my email. It changed my day. If little Frank can change my day that much, how much more might daily prayer, consistent prayer, universal prayer change us? Sometimes we don't know how to pray. And that's okay. The only way that we can do it wrong is if we don't do it at all. So here's some thoughts. Pray this week by writing down three lists of names. People you are close to, people that you are acquainted with, and people who challenge you. And pray for all three lists. Pray by reciting the Lord's Prayer before each meal. Pray by coloring the front of your bulletin. Pray by sitting with your eyes closed for five minutes and just seeing what comes up. Pray with tears and moans and laughs. Pray for each person your dog greets on a walk. Pray for everyone. Pray for everyone and be reminded that God's grace is for everyone. And watch yourself be changed. Amen.